Preface and Introduction to Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900. Preface. Thus we were told in words divine that there were truths men could not bear, e'en from the lips of Christ to hear. These have now slowly been unfurled, but still to a reluctant world. Prophets will yet arise to teach truths which the schoolmen fail to reach, which priestly doctrine still would hide, and worldly votaries deride, and statesmen fain would set aside. I make no apology for this preface. It may be unusual, but then the book it deals with is unusual. There is but one object in Gloriana. It is to speak of evils which do exist, to study facts which it is a crime to neglect, to sketch an artificial position, the creation of laws false to nature, unparalleled for injustice and hardship. Many critics, like the rest of humanity, are apt to be unfair. They take up a book, and when they find that it does not accord with their sentiments, they attempt to wreck it by ridicule and petty, spiteful criticism. They forget to ask themselves, why is this book written? They altogether omit to go to the root of the author's purpose. And the result is that false testimony is often borne against principles, which, though drastic, are pure, which, though sharp as the surgeon's knife, are yet humane for it is genuine sympathy with humanity that arouses them. There is no romance worth reading which has not the solid foundation of truth to support it. There is no excuse for the existence of romance unless it fixes thought on that truth which underlies it. Gloriana may be a romance, a dream, but in the first instance it is inextricably interwoven with truth, in the second instance dreams the work of the brain are species of thought and thought is an attribute of God. Therefore it is God's creation. There may be some who, reading Gloriana, will feel shocked and be apt to misjudge the author. There are others who will understand, appreciate, and sympathize. There are yet others who, hating truth, will receive it with jibes and sneers. There are many who, delighting in the evil which it fain would banish, will resent it as an unpardonable attempt against their liberties. An onslaught on public opinion is very like leading a forlorn hope. The leader knows full well that death lies in the breach, yet that leader knows also that great results may spring from the death which is therefore readily sought and faced. Gloriana pleads woman's cause, pleads for her freedom, for the just acknowledgment of her rights. It pleads that her equal humanity with man shall be recognized, and therefore that her claim to share what he has arrogated to himself shall be considered. Gloriana pleads that, in woman's degradation, man shall no longer be debased, that in her elevation he shall be upraised and ennobled. The reader of its pages will observe the author's conviction, everywhere expressed, that nature ordains the close companionship, not division of the sexes and that it is opposition to nature which produces jealousy, intrigue, and unhealthy rivalry. Gloriana is written with no antagonism to man. Just the contrary. The author's best and truest friends, with few exceptions, have been and are men. But the author will never recognize man's glory and welfare in woman's degradation. And hark, a voice with accents clear is raised, which all are forced to hear. Tis woman's voice, for ages hushed, pleading the cause of woman crushed, pleading the cause of purity, of freedom, honor, equity, of all the lost and the forlorn, of all for whom the Christ was born. If, therefore, the following story should help men to be generous and just, should awaken the sluggards amongst women to a sense of their position, and should thus lead to a rapid revolution, it will not have been written in vain. The Author Introduction to Gloriana, or A Dream of the Revolution of 1900 A rose-red sunset, 
mingling its radiance with the purple heath, flooding the silver lake with bluish light, dyeing the ocean gray a crimson hue, streaking the paling sky with rosy shafts, clinging to nature with a lingering kiss, ere it shall vanish from a drowsy earth. To rouse a new-decked cloak of shining gold, a waking world far o'er the ocean's wave. Maremna sleeps, close cushioned in the heather's warm embrace. The rose-red sunset plays around her form, a grateful, girlish figure, lithe and fair, small, slim, yet firmly knit with nature's power, unfettered nature, which will not be bound by fashion's prison rules and cultured laws. Maremna sleeps. One rosy cheek lies pillowed on her hand, and through her waving, wandering auburn curls the zephyr cupids frolic merrily, tossing them to and fro upon her brow in sportive play. It is a brow of thought, endowed by God and nature, though, alas, held in paralysis by selfish laws, which strive to steal a fair inheritance and bid the woman bow the knee to man. Maremna sleeps. The white lids veil the large, gray, lustrous eyes, the auburn lashes sweep the sunlit cheeks, yet they are wet and cling to the soft skin whereon the damp of tears is glazing fast. Maremna's sleep is not the sleep of rest, for ever and anon the blood-red lips unclose and strive to speak, but yet remain silent and speechless, tied by some dread force which intervenes, denying to the brain that comfort which the power of speech doth bring. Who is Maremna? A noble's child, reared amidst nature's scenes, her earliest friends. They guided her first steps, speaking of God and his stupendous works leave ere religion's dogma intervened. Child of a chieftain o'er whose broad domain she roamed, a happy, free, unfettered waif, loving the mountain crag and the forest lone. The straths and quarries, rugged glens and haunts of the red deer and dove-like ptarmigan. Loving the language of the torrent's roar, or the rough river's wild bespated rush. Loving the dark pine woods amidst whose glades the timid roe hides from the gaze of man. Loving the great gray ocean's varying face, now calm, now rugged, rising into storm anon so peaceful, so serene and still, when passion's fury sinks beneath the wave. Maremna sleeps. Amidst the scenes that reared her early years, yet is Maremna now no more a child, nor guileless with the innocence of youth. Hers it has been to roam God's mighty world, and learn the ways and woeful deeds of men, and, weary with her world-wide pilgrimage, Maremna's steps have sought her early haunts, hoping for rest where childhood once did play. Rest for Maremna. An idle thought, a foolish sentiment. Unto the brain which God has bidden think, no rest can come from solitude's retreat. For solitude breeds thought and shapes its course, and bids it live within the form of speech, or bids the mighty pen proclaim its life, and write its words upon the scrolls of men. Thus with Maremna. Rest she has sought, but sought it all in vain. What God decrees, no mortal hand can stay. Think, he ordains, and lo, the brain must think, nor close its eyes upon the mammoth truth. Truth must prevail. Truth must be held aloft. What matter if the cold world sneers or scoffs? Sneering and scoffing is the work of man, truth the almighty handiwork of God. It may be dimmed, it may be blurred from sight, yet must it triumph in the end and win. For is it not truth a sun which cannot die, though unbelief may cloud it for a time? Maremna sleeps. Sleeps where in childhood oft she lay and dreamed, dreamed of fantastic worlds and fairy realms. And now in sleep Maremna dreams again, but dreams no more of elves and laughing sprites. Hers, though a dream, is stern reality, mingled with visions of a future day. Hers is a dream of hideous, living wrong, wrong which tis woman's duty to proclaim and man's to right, and right, right speedily, or crush the form of justice underfoot. Maremna sleeps, 
and in her dream a vision fills her brain. This is Maremna's dream. End of introduction. Book One, Chapter One of Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book One, Chapter One. I am tired, mother. Tired, child, and why? Mother, I have been spouting to the wild sea waves. And what have you been saying to them, Gloria? Ah, mother, ever so much. Let us look at the speakers, a mother and child, the former as she stands leaning against a stone balustrade, which overlooks a small Italian garden, upon which the sun is shining brightly. Far out beyond is the gleaming sea, and on its sparkling, silvery sheen the woman's eyes are absently fixed as she hearkens to the complaining prattle of the child by her side. She is a beautiful woman, is Speranza de Lara, one upon whom Dame Nature has showered her favours freely. As the stranger, looking upon her for the first time, would deem her but a girl in years, and exclaim admiringly at her beauty, it would be difficult to convince him that her age is thirty-five, as in effect it is. Speranza's eyes are blue, with a turquoise shade lighting up their clear depths and a fringe of silky, auburn eyelashes confining them within bounds. Her magnificent hair is of a slightly lighter hue, and as the sun plays on the heavy coil that is twisted gracefully upon her noble head, the golden sparks dance merrily around it, like an aureole of gold. And the child? We must look nearer still at her, for she not only is beautiful, but there is writ upon her face the glowing signs of genius. Like her mother, Gloriana, or as we shall prefer to call her Gloria, has blue eyes, but they are the blue of the sapphire, deep in contradistinction to the turquoise shade, which characterizes those of Speranza. Auburn eyelashes, too, fringe the child's wonderful eyes, but again these are many shades darker than the mother's, while masses of auburn curls play negligently and unconfined, covering the girl's back like a veil of old gold. Such is Gloriana de Lara at the age of twelve. Won't Gloria tell her mother what that ever so much was? She puts the question gently, does Speranza. She has never moved from the position in which we first found her, and her eyes are still dreamily searching the waste of blue waters beyond. But as she speaks, the child puts her arm caressingly through that of the mother's, and lays her golden head against that mother's shoulder. Ah, yes, mother, of course I will tell you. Then tell me, Gloria. I was imagining the foam flakelets to be girls, mother, and I looked upon them as my audience. I told them, mother darling, of all the wrongs that girls and women have to suffer, and then I bade them rise as one to right these wrongs. I told them all I could think of to show them how to do so, and then I told them that I would be their leader and lead them to victory or die. And the wavelets shouted, mother. I seemed to hear them cheer me on. I seemed to see them rising into storm. The wind uprose them, and their white foam rushed towards me. And I seemed to see in this sudden change the elements of a great revolution. Like a dream, Gloria. A living dream, mother. At least it was so to me. It brought a feeling to my heart, mother, which I know will never leave it more, until, until—" The girl pauses, and the great tears rise to her eyes. Speranza raises herself suddenly, and, confronting the child, lays both hands upon her shoulders. "'Until what, child?' "'Until I have won, mother!' cries Gloria, as she raises her glorious eyes, in which the tears still tremble, to her mother's face. Ah, Gloria, the odds are against you, my darling. Don't I know that, mother? Don't I know that well? But I am not afraid. I made a vow, mother, today. I made it to those waves, and something tells me that I shall keep that vow and win, though in doing so I may die. 
Hush, Gloria, hush, child. Don't talk like that. And don't you want me to win, mother? After all you have suffered, after all you have taught me, would you have your child turn back from the path she has set herself to follow, because perhaps at that path's end lies death? Child, it is a cause I would gladly lay down my life for, but how can I bring myself to wish you to sacrifice yourself? What is sacrifice in a great cause, mother? I fear no sacrifice, no pain, no consequence, so long as victory crowns me in the end." The mother's arms are round her child's neck now, her head is bending down, and the bright gold of Speranza's lovely hair is close beside the glossy, wandering dark gold curls of Gloria. In the heart of the former a newborn hope is rising, vague, undefinable, yet still there and which fills it with a happiness she has not known for many and many a day. "'My child!' she exclaimed softly. "'Can it be that after all these years of weary, lonely suffering, I am awaking to find in you, you, the offspring of a forbidden love, the messenger that shall awake the world to woman's wrongs, and make suffering such as I have endured no longer possible?' "'Yes, mother, I feel it answers Gloria earnestly. And that is why I have made my plans today. Everything must have a beginning, you know, mother, and therefore I must begin and begin at once. You must help me, mother darling. I can do nothing without your cooperation. Tell me your plans, Gloria, and mother will help you if she can. My plans are many, but the first must have a premier consideration. Mother, I must go to school." "'To school, child! I thought you always have begged me not to send you to school.' "'It must be to a boy's school, mother. You must send me to Eton.' "'To Eton?' "'Yes, mother. Don't you understand?' Here a retrospect is necessary to enable the reader to comprehend the above conversation. Thirty-five years previously, there had been born to a young widow in the Midland counties of England a posthumous child and daughter, to whom the name of Speranza had been given. The widow, Mrs. Delara by name, was left badly off. Her husband, who had been an officer in the British service, had sold out, and accepted an estate agency from a rich relative, upon whose property he lived in a tiny but snug cottage which nestled amidst some pine and oak woods on the shores of as beautiful a lake as was to be seen all the country round. Captain and Mrs. Delara were a very happy pair. Theirs had been a love-match, and she never regretted the rich offers of marriage which she had rejected for the sake of the handsome, dashing, but well-nigh penniless young officer. Her father, furious at what he considered a maze alliance, had cut her off with a shilling and thus it was that the two had had a hard struggle to make ends meet on the little possessed by the captain. What mattered it? They were happy. Grief, however, soon came to cloud that home of peace and contentment. An accidental discharge of his gun inflicted on Captain Delara a mortal wound. He died in the arms of his heartbroken wife, who lived just long enough to give birth to the little Speranza dying a fortnight later and leaving penniless and friendless, two little boys and the baby girl referred to. The captain's rich relative adopted them. He was a kind-hearted man and felt that he could not turn them adrift on the world, but his wife, a hard-hearted and scheming woman, resented the adoption bitterly and led the children a sad and unhappy life. She had a son and daughter of her own aged respectively five and six years, and upon these she lavished a false and mistaken affection, spoiling them in every possible way, and bringing them up to be anything but pleasant to those around them. When old enough, Speranza's brothers were sent to school, and given to understand by their adopted father that they might choose their own professions. The eldest selected the army, the youngest the navy and each made a start in his respective line of work. But Speranza, being a girl, had no chances thrown out to her. She was a very beautiful girl, strong, healthy, and clever. 
but of what use were any of these attributes to her. "'If I were only a boy,' she would bitterly moan to herself, "'I could make my way in the world. I could work for my living, and be free, instead of being what I am, the butt of my adopted mother.' It is necessary to explain that Speranza's adopted parents were the Earl and Countess of Westray, and that their two children were Bertrand Viscount Alte and Lady Lucy Marie. Dorlington Court was the family seat, and it was here that Speranza spent the first sixteen years of her life. There were great doings at Dorlington Court when Lord Alte came of age. A large party was invited to take part in the week's festivities, and duly assembled for the occasion. Many beautiful women were there, but none could compare in beauty with Speranza de Lara. She was only seventeen years of age at the time, but already the promise of exquisite loveliness could not but be apparent to every one. It captivated many, but none more so than young Alte himself. He was not a good man, was the young Viscount. Injudicious indulgence as a child had laid the seeds of selfishness and indifference to the feelings of others. He had been so accustomed to have all he wanted that such a word as refusal was hardly known to him. He had grown up in the belief that what Alte asked for must be granted as a matter of course. And now, in pursuit of his passions, he chose to think himself, or imagined himself, in love with Speranza, and had determined to make her his wife. He chose his opportunity for asking her. It was the night of a great ball given at Dorrington Court during the week's festivities. Speranza had been dancing with him, and when the dance was over, he led her away into one of the beautiful conservatories that opened from one of the reception rooms and was lighted up with softly subdued pink fairy lamps. He thought he had never seen her look more beautiful, and his passion hungered to make her his own more than ever. He put the usual question, a question which, no reason has yet been given why, a man arrogates to himself alone to put. He never dreamed that she, the penniless Speranza de Lara, the adopted orphan of his father and mother, would refuse him. He took it as of course for granted that she would jump at his offer. Were there not girls, and plenty too, in the house, who would have given their eyes for such a proposal? He put the question, therefore, confidently, nay, even negligently, and awaited the answer without a doubt in his mind as to what it would be. He started. She was speaking in reply. Could he believe his ears, and was that answer no? And yet there was no mistaking it, for the voice, though low, was clear and very distinct. It decidedly said him nay. Yes, Speranza had refused him. It was the first rebuff he had ever received in his life, the first denial that had ever been made to request of his. It staggered him, filled him with blind, almost ungovernable fury. More than ever he coveted the girl who had rejected him, more than ever he determined to make her what the law told him he should be if he married her his own. He left her suddenly, anger and rage at heart, and she with a sad and weary restlessness upon her, wandered out into the clear moonlit night, and stood gazing over the beautiful lake at her feet, and at the tiny cottage at the far end where her father and mother had died, and where she had been born. What was it that stood in Speranza's eyes? Tears, large and clear as crystals, were falling from them, and sobs shook her graceful, upright frame as she stood with her hands clasped to her forehead in an agony of grief. Only seventeen, poor child, and yet so miserable. It was a cruel sight for any one to see. But no one saw it save the pale moon and twinkling stars that looked down calmly and sweetly on the sobbing girl. A harsh voice sounded suddenly at her elbow. A rough grasp was laid upon her arm. With a cry in which loathing and horror were mixed, Speranza turned round, only to confront the contemptuous, haughty woman, who had never said a kind or nice word to her in all her life. "'How dare you, girl, behave like this!' had cried the Countess furiously. "'How dare you so answer my darling boy, 
who has thus condescended to honour you with his love." In vain the miserable child had striven to explain to the infuriated woman that she did not care for Lord Altay. Such an explanation had only aggravated the Countess's anger, who, after many and various threats, had declared that unless Speranza consented to gratify her darling boy's passion, she would induce the Earl to deprive Speranza's two brothers of their allowances, and therefore of their professions, which, in other words, meant ruin to them. She was a clever woman, was Lady Westray. She knew exactly where to strike to gain her end. The threat which she threw out about Speranza's two brothers she knew pretty well would take effect. For did she not also know that out to them the poor child's whole heart had gone? Rather than injure them, the girl determined to sacrifice herself. A month later a great wedding took place. Envied of all who saw her, Speranza de Lara became Viscountess Alte, and the wife of the man whom she detested and loathed. Sold by the law which declares that, however brutally a man may treat his wife, so that he does not strike her, she has no power to free herself from him. Sold by the law which declares her to be that man's slave, this woman, bright with the glory of a high intellect, perfect in nature's health and strength, was committed to the keeping of a man whom fashion courted and patted on the back, whilst declaring him at the same time to be the veriest roué in London. He could go and do as he pleased, indulge in brutal excess, pander to every hideous passion of his heart, poison with his vile touch the beautiful creature whom he looked down upon as only a woman. But she, if she dared to overstep the line of propriety and openly declared her love for another, she would be doomed to social ostracism, shunned and despised as a wanton, and out of the pale of decent society. She did so dare. For six long years she bore with his brutal excess and depraved passions. For six long years she suffered the torture which only those who have so suffered can understand. Then she succumbed. It was a dark November evening when she met her fate. The Altays were in Scotland, entertaining a party of friends for the covert shooting in Lord Westray's splendid Wictonshire preserves. The guests had all arrived but one, and he put in an appearance when the remainder of the party had gone upstairs to dress for dinner. Lady Altay had waited for him, as he was momentarily expected, and on his arrival he had been ushered into the drawing-room. His name was Harry Kintor, a captain in a smart marching regiment. As she entered the drawing-room he was standing with his back to the fire, and their eyes met. Right through her ran a thrill, she knew not why nor wherefore, while he, transfixed by her beauty, could not remove his eyes. There have been such cases before of love at first sight. This was a case about which there could be no dispute. Both felt it was so, both knew it to be beyond recall. How she struggled against her fate none can tell. With her husband's increased brutality the gentleness and devotion of young Kintor was all the more on evidence. And when at length he bade her fly with him beyond the reach of so much misery and cruelty, was it a wonder that she succumbed and flew in the face of the law that bound her to the contrary? She left him, that cruel brute who had made her life a desert and a hell. She left him for one who to her was chivalrous and tender, loving and sympathetic. The world cried shame upon her and spoke of Lord Alte as an injured man. The world ostracized her while it courted anew the fiend who had so grievously wronged her. And when, in the hunger of his baffled passion, this pampered roué followed the two who had fled from him and with cold-blooded cruelty shot dead young Harry Kintor, the world declared it could not blame him and that it served Lady Alte right. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana or the Revolution of 1900. 
Book One, Chapter Two. Good morning, my dear," exclaims Lady Manderton as she enters the cosy boudoir of her bosom friend and confidant, Mrs. De Lacy Trevor, as this latter, in a neat peignoir, lies stretched out, novel in hand, on an easy couch overlooking the fast-filling street of Piccadilly, about eleven o'clock in the morning of the fifth June, eighteen ninety. Seal, my dear, what brings you here, and dress too at this unearthly hour? Shoot, Vivi, don't talk so loud. A mere rencontre, that's all. Arthur and I have arranged a little lark, and I told him to meet me here. I knew you wouldn't mind. He he, giggles Vivi, but what have you done with man? Oh, he's safe enough, my dear, gone off to his club. Thinks I've gone to get a gown tried on. He he, what fools men are! Think themselves deuced clever, nevertheless, Dodo, laughs Vivi. It's not an hour since Treby was raving at me, laying down the law at the way I go on with Captain Kilmarnock. Of course, I pretended to be awfully cut up, rubbed my eyes, got up a few tears and sniffs, got rid of him with a kiss or two, packed him off to his club, and at twelve o'clock Kill and I were off to Maidenhead together. This announcement creates the greatest amusement between the two ladies, judging by the peals of laughter that follow it. By the by, Dodo, where were you yesterday? inquires Vivi Trevor, after the laughter had subsided. I, my dear? Why, I was with H. R. H.'s party for the fourth of June. You can't think what a jolly day we had, Vivi. Some of the recitations were quite delightful, and there was a boy called Hector de Strange, who was simply too lovely for words. We all fell in love with him, I can tell you. I never saw such eyes in my life. Won't he break some of our hearts some day? Hector de Strange. But who is he? That's just what everyone was asking, but no one seemed to know. It appears he has taken the school by storm. Does everything tip-top. Splendid batsman, bowler, oarsman, wonderful at rackets, undefeatable at books. In fact, my dear, beautiful as an Adonis, and clever past expression. Oh, Dodo, I must see this Adonis. I love pretty boys. And plucky ones, too, laughs Vivi. I was speaking to young Estcourt, who is his chum, and he told me that when Hector de Strange first came to Eton, a good many attempts were made to bully him, but he soon settled his tormentors and gave one of them, a big overgrown monster, such a drubbing that he never molested him more. What fun, Dodo, it would have been to see my Adonis punching the overgrown bully! I did laugh when Estcourt told me. I do so hate overgrown boys, don't you, Dodo? Of course I do, Vivi. Detest them." There is a ring at the doorbell. Vivi jumps up and looks out of the window. "'It's Arthur!' is all she exclaims. "'Well, ta-ta, Vivi. Won't bother you with him,' laughs Lady Manderton as she stoops to kiss her friend. See you tonight, I suppose, at Ferdy's, eh? Love to kill. Don't let Treby catch you, and a pleasant outing to you both." Saying which, she is off out of the room and running downstairs to meet her friend, Sir Arthur Muster Day, a smart young guardsman, whom it has pleased her for the time being to think that she likes better than anyone else in the world. They are off together, happy in each other's company. Sir Arthur is not married and he thinks it just the thing to be seen about as much as possible in the company of one of London's newest belles. Lady Manderton doesn't care a rap for her husband, and is considerably bored that her husband evinces a certain amount of affection for her. She only married him for his money and position, and did not at all bargain for the affection part of the affair. As for Vivi, after her friend is gone, she jumps up and rings for her maid. That important individual, having made her appearance, she and Vivi are soon engrossed with the all-paramount question of the moment—dress. Half a dozen gowns are pulled out, put on, pulled off, and discarded, until at length one appears to please more than the others. "'How do you think I look in this, Marie?' she inquires a little anxiously. "'Is it becoming?' "'Mais, madame, c'est tout à fait charmante,' replies the well-drilled maid with an expression of admiration. Vivi is satisfied. The gown remains on her person, and in a short time she is dressed and ready for her day's outing. 
twelve o'clock strikes. A neat brougham dashes up to the door. In less time almost than it takes to tell it, Vivi has taken her seat in the carriage, and is being whirled through the busy streets of London en route to Captain Kilmarnock's rooms. There she will pick him up and together they will proceed to Maidenhead to do God knows. We had better leave them. A few minutes later there is another ring at the door, and the footman opens it to Mr. de Lacy Trevor. As he does so, the latter inquires, "'Is Mrs. Trevor in?' "'No, sir, just gone out,' answers the servant. "'Do you know where to, James?' again asks Mr. Trevor. "'I do not, sir, but perhaps Mademoiselle Marie will know.' Marie is called and arrives all smiles and bows. "'Really, she thinks Madame has gone out for a drive with her friend Lady Manderton, and to lunch with her afterwards, c'est tout.' Mr. Trevor sighs. "'There will be no lunch wanted, James,' he observes quietly. "'I shall lunch at the club.' He wanders down the street in the direction of St. James's. He wonders if Evie has forgotten the promise she made him that morning to lunch at home, and go for a ride with him afterwards. He so rarely sees her now, and when he does, it is seldom alone. She never seems to have any time to give to him, and yet he is not brutal to her, or neglectful, or wrapped up in someone else, as many other men are. He loves her so dearly, and would do anything to make her happy. But he can quite see how she shuns him, and how much happier she looks when in Captain Kilmarnock's company. And then, with a shudder, he starts, and stares eagerly across the street, for there she is. Yes, actually, there she is, in Captain Kilmarnock's brougham, with a captain beside her driving rapidly in the direction of Piccadilly. Mr. Trevor has a strange lump in his throat as he ascends the steps of the conservative and enters that roomy club. Waiter, he calls out, and his voice is somewhat husky. Yes, sir. Bring me a stiff brandy and soda, waiter, and mind it is stiff continues Mr. Trevor, as he throws himself wearily into a chair. The soda with its stiff complement of brandy arrives. It is mixed carefully by the waiter and handed to the sad-hearted man. He drinks it eagerly. He has not a strong head, and knows that he cannot take much, but he feels that oblivion must in this instance be sought, if possible, no matter how, so long as it is attained. The brandy, in a measure, has the desired effect. He feels it perforating through his body and mounting to his brain. Things don't look quite so gloomy to him now, and the loneliness of his position is less acutely felt. Two men are talking to each other close by him. He knows one of them. It is Sir Ralph Veriton, and he holds in his hand a copy of the June number of the Free Review. "'It is a wonderful article for a boy to write and an Eton boy, too!" he hears the baronet exclaiming. "'Have you read it, Critchley?' "'Well, no, I can't say that I have, but I will, old chap, when I get home. I'm afraid I haven't time to just now.' "'What's that, Veriton?' inquires Mr. Trevor, leaning forward in his chair. "'Anything particularly clever?' "'Hello, Trevor, you there? Didn't see you, old man. What, you haven't read an Eton boy's essay on woman's position?' Everyone is talking about it. It's deuced clever and original, whatever one may think of the opinions, and it is clearly written by a lad who will make his mark in the world. Let's have a look at it, Veriton, if you don't want it. There's a good chap. I want something to read," exclaims Mr. Trevor eagerly, reaching out his hand for the periodical, which the baronet passes to him good-naturedly. It is open at the page of honour, the first page in the book and as Mr. Trevor scans the heading he reads it as follows. Woman's Position in This World, by Hector de Strange, an Eton Boy. He starts reading it, languidly at first, as if the remarks of a boy on such a subject cannot possibly be worth reading, but he is soon absorbed in the article, and never budges in his chair until he has read it through and through. And there are some parts to which he turns again and again as though he would burn their truths into his brain, and keep them there never to be forgotten. One in especial rivets his attention, so much so that he commits it to memory. When a girl is born, it ran, no especial difference is made in the care of her by doctor or nurse. 
up to a certain age, the treatment which she and her brother receive is exactly the same. Why, I ask, should there ever be any change in this treatment? Why should such a marked contrast be drawn later on between the sexes? Is it for the good of either that the girl should be both physically and mentally stunted, both in her intellect and body, that she should be held back while the boy is pressed forward? Can it be argued with any show of reason that her capacity for study is less, and her power of observation naturally dwarfed in comparison with that of the boy? Certainly not. I confidently assert that where a girl has fair play, and is given equal opportunities with the boy, she not only equals him in mental capacity, but far outruns him in such. And I also confidently assert that given the physical opportunities afforded to the boy to develop and expand and strengthen the body by what are called manly exercises, the girl would prove herself every inch his equal in physical strength. There are those, I know, who will sneer at these opinions, but in the words of Lord Beaconsfield I can only asseverate that the time will come when those who sneer will be forced to acknowledge the truth of this assertion. Well, then, granting for the sake of argument, that what I have stated is correct, why, I ask, should all that men look forward to and hold most dear be denied to women? Why should the professions which men have arrogated to themselves be entirely monopolized by their sex to the exclusion of women? I see no manner of reason why, if women receive the same moral, mental, and physical training that men do, they should not be as fit, nay, infinitely more fit, to undertake the same duties and responsibilities as men. I do not see that we should be a whit less badly governed if we had a woman prime minister or a mixed cabinet, or if women occupied seats in the houses of parliament or on the bench in the courts of justice. Of course, woman's fitness to undertake these duties depends entirely on the manner in which she is educated. If you stunt the intellect, tell her nothing, and refuse to exercise the physical powers which nature has given her, you must expect little from such an unfortunate creature. Put man in the same position in which you put woman, and he would be in a very short time just as mentally and physically stunted as she is. All very well to declare that it is a woman's business to bear children, to bring them up, to attend to household matters, and to leave the rest to men. A high-spirited girl or woman will not, in every instance, accept this definition of her duties by man as correct. That such a definition is clearly man's, it is not difficult to see, for woman would never have voluntarily condemned herself to a life of such inert and ambitionless duties as these. But so long as this definition of woman's duties and position be observed and accepted by society, so long will this latter be a prey to all the vials and horrors that afflict it, and which are a result of woman's subjection and degradation. Think you, who read these words, that hundreds of women, now unhappily married, would ever have contracted that terrible tie, had they been aware of what they were doing? or had they had the smallest hope of advancement and prospects of success in life without? Certainly not. Marriage is contracted in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred by women desirous of making for themselves a home, and because in no other quarter can they adopt agreeable and pleasant professions and occupations like men. Were it possible, they would either not have married, or at least have waited, until, with the knowledge of man which they should possess, but which, unfortunately, nowadays comes to them only with marriage, they could select for themselves, with their eyes open, a partner suited to them in every respect. As it is, what does one see? Women, especially in the higher grades of society, marry only to escape in many instances the prim restraints of home. Others marry for money and position, because they know that the portals through which men may pass to try for these are closed to them. The cruel laws by which men have shut women out from every hope of winning name and fame are responsible for hundreds of wretched marriages, which have seared the world with their griefs. If in the narrow sphere within which she moves, a woman errs, let not the man blame her, but rather look to the abolition of unnatural laws which have brought about her degradation. Mr. Trevor sits very still in his chair a flood of thoughts have come to fill his brain. 
they keep him very busy and occupied. The revelations thrown upon woman's position by the straightforward, truth-breathing article of Hector de Strange have taken him by storm, and have completely revolutionized his ideas. He has hitherto been so accustomed to look upon and treat women with the self-satisfied, conscious feeling of superiority assumed by men, that such ideas as these before him are startlingly strange and extraordinary. His position with Vivi and hers in regard to him, presents itself now to his mind in a totally different light to that in which he has hitherto been accustomed to regard it. He remembers how he first met her hardly a year ago, a beautiful, lively, healthy girl, whose scheming mother, knowing no better, had thrust her into the busy mart, willing to sell her to the highest bidder. He remembers how passionately he fell in love with this girl, how he never paused to ask himself if his love were returned. He recalls full well the bitter look that had crossed her face when he had asked her to be his wife, and the cold, matter-of-fact way in which she had accepted him. Then his thoughts fly back to his wedding day, and a shudder runs through Launcelot Trevor as he recalls the utter absence of love on her part towards him. And remembering all this, he cannot but feel that Hector de Strange is right. If in the narrow sphere within which poor Vivi had moved, she had, according to the notions of propriety laid down by Mrs. Grundy, erred, Launcelot Trevor feels that the blame must rest not so much with her as with the cruel laws that had left that beautiful girl no other option but to sell herself for gold. For, be it remembered, that she had been educated up to no higher level, been imbued with no better aim. She had been taught that the only opening for a girl is to get herself well married that while men could go forth into the world with a score of professions to choose from, she must forever regard herself as shut out from that world of enterprise, daring and fame, created, so says man, solely for himself. He sits on his chair, his thoughts still busy with the new problem that has presented itself so startlingly to his mind. The luncheon hour is far past, much of the afternoon has slipped away. Still, Launcelot Trevor remains where he had seated himself many hours before. Men keep coming in and out, friends and acquaintances nod to him as they pass. He scarcely heeds them, or pays attention to what they say. His mind is absorbed by the truths which he has faced for the first time. Suddenly he starts. The clock is striking seven. He remembers that at eight o'clock he and Vivi are engaged to dine out. He jumps up, bids the hall porter hail a hansom, and in a few minutes is being driven towards Piccadilly. "'Has Mrs. Trevor returned yet?' he again inquires of the servant who opens the door to him. "'Yes, sir. She is in the drawing-room with Captain Kilmarnock.' He walks slowly upstairs. All is very silent in the room mentioned. He stands on the threshold, hardly daring to open the door. He can hear a rustling inside and yes, unmistakably, the sound of a kiss. He coughs audibly as he lays his hand on the door's handle. He can hear a scuffling of feet, and on entering perceives Vivi sitting bolt upright on the sofa, and Captain Kilmarnock apparently warming his hands over the fireplace. Unfortunately, there is no fire. She looks at him as he comes in, and for a moment their eyes meet. A bright flush rises to Vivi's cheeks. She expects to see him furious, as he had been that morning, and is surprised, nay, even awed, by the sad expression on his face. "'Vivi,' he says very quietly, "'I think we ought to be dressing for dinner. Good evening to you, Kilmarnock. Are you to be at Ferdays to-night?' "'No, Trevor,' stammers the captain, visibly uncomfortable. "'I have another engagement.' "'Oh, well!' Shall see you again, I suppose, soon. Good night, old chap. Must go and dress. Vivi, dear, don't be late." He goes out as he speaks, and closes the door behind him. Hector de Strange's words are still next his heart. "'Poor Vivi,' he mutters to himself, "'it is not her fault. Poor Vivi!' He is hardly out of the room when she looks up at Captain Kilmarnock. The scared expression is still in her face. "'Kill,' she whispers, 
That was a near squeak. You had better be off, man. Didn't hear the front doorbell ring, did you? No, he answers in a rather sulky tone. Hang him. He's always where he's not wanted. But you are right. I'd better be off. Tomorrow at three. Don't forget. All right, she answers with a smile. End of Book One, Chapter Two Book One, Chapter Three of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred. Book One, Chapter Three. Always busy and astir, the little town of Melton Mowbray presents a more than usual busy aspect on the morning of 15th April, 1894. It is early yet, nevertheless the streets ring with the sound of trotting and cantering hacks, as well as the more sober paces of the strings of horses returning from exercise to their respective stables. People are coming and going at a rapid rate. They nearly all seem to know each other judging by the little nods and good-mornings and such-like familiar greetings with which friends meet, and in which these aforementioned personages indulge as they hurry by each other. A party of horsemen and horsewomen are just riding out of the stables belonging to the limes. They are laughing and talking merrily. We have seen two of the women before, and their names are Mrs. de Lacey Trevor and Lady Manderton. Close in attendance upon them are two smart, good-looking men, whom we must introduce to the reader as Lord Charles Dartrey and the Earl of Westray. The former appears to be entirely taken up with the first-named lady, the latter, already introduced to the reader in a former chapter as Lord Elte, with the last-named one. There is yet another pair in that cheery group that we must particularly notice. They are a man and woman, both young, both good-looking, and both unmistakably at home in the saddle. If one can judge from appearances, the woman must be about twenty-two years of age, the man perhaps five or six years her senior. Both are mounted on grey horses, and both look every inch what they are, splendid equestrians. The woman is well known in society's world, as also in the tiny hunting world of Melton. She is Lady Flora Desmond, and the man is handsome Captain Jack Delamere. They trot through the streets at a merry pace down past the Harborough Hotel, over the railway, away on by Wicklow Lodge, towards Burton Lazarus. It is a beautiful morning, and the sun is shining brightly on the flats that lie below. Dalby Hall, nestling amidst its woods on the far hillside, stands out distinct and clear, with the same bright sun gleaming on its gables and windows. "'What a glorious morning, Jack!' exclaims Lady Flora enthusiastically. Why, it's like summer, is it not? The others are a little on ahead, and these two have fallen in the rear. Jack looks at the speaker with a smile. It's a grand day, Florrie, and it suits you too. I never saw you looking better in my life. She flushes up. Florrie Desmond does not care about compliments, she values them at their worth, but she and Jack are fast friends, and she is not quite averse to them from him. She answers, however. Shut up, you goose, and don't talk nonsense. She is a clever woman, is Flora Desmond, cleverer far than some people take her to be. Her bringing up has not been exactly like other women's, and she is always kicked against the restraints and restrictions put upon her sex. She is the daughter of the Marquis and Marchioness of Douglasdale, and an orphan, having lost her father at an early age. Lady Douglasdale was, in her day, a very beautiful woman a persona grata at court, where her husband exercised the duties of comptroller of the household, and was a favourite with his sovereign. But after the Marquis's death she took greatly to travelling, and thus it was that Flora Ruglan, in conjunction with her twin brother Archie, saw most of the great world of Europe before she was ten years of age. Travelling expands the mind, and brightens the senses. It had this effect upon the girl forming much of her character before its time. At that early age she exhibited peculiar characteristics. No one could get her to settle down to study under a governess. She loathed the sight of schoolbooks, and led her unfortunate preceptors a sad life. 
Yet, in strange contradiction to so much willfulness and apparent indolence, she was seldom without the companionship of a book in her play-hours, and when not otherwise engaged with her brother, would invariably be found poring over these books, thirstily seeking knowledge or committing to paper, in powerful language, for one so young, the impressions of her youthful brain. She had dreams, had Flora Ruglan, dreams of a bright future, an adventurous career. The time had not arrived when the road which she and her twin brother had been pursuing would branch off in different directions, his leading forth to opportunities of power, fame and glory, hers along a lane narrow and cramped, with nothing to seek at the end save that against which her bright independent spirit rebelled and revolted. But it came at last when the companion of her happy childhood's days was taken from her, when Archie was sent to school and she was left alone. It came upon her with a suddenness which she found difficult to realize, and the blow was terrible. To describe what she suffered would be well-nigh impossible. Only those who by experience have learnt it could be brought to understand the horror of her position. But Flora Ruglan, having faced it, brought all the courage of her nature to support it, though from that moment she became utterly changed. She had no one in whom to confide, neither her mother nor anyone else would have understood her. With girls of her own age she had nothing in common, and they looked on her with awe as a proud, stuck-up being. None could guess at the warm heart that beat beneath Flora Ruglan's apparently cold and reserved demeanour, except one, and that one was a boy of about her own age. She had made his acquaintance during the holidays, when Archie, home from school, had invited his best pal to spend them at Ruglan Manor, the beautiful dower property of Lady Douglasdale. It was with young Lord Estcourt that Archie Douglasdale had struck up so keen a friendship. The lads had been new boys at Eton together, and in the first strangeness of introduction to that boy's world had been thrown into each other's company a good deal, being in the same house and, as in Flora's case, much of the same age. When Estcourt came to Ruglan Manor, Flora Ruglan was about seventeen years of age. She was interested in her brother's friend, inasmuch as he had lately lost his mother and was an orphan. It had not taken long for a firm friendship to spring up between the boy and girl. Nigel Estcourt was an only child, had never known what it was to have brothers and sisters, and was ready to look upon Flora in that light gladly enough. He and she were a great deal in each other's company, and for the first time in her life she unloosed the cords of her heart, and told him of the trouble that had descended upon her life. He sympathized with her, did young Nigel. How could he help it, being, as he was, the friend of Hector de Strange? That extraordinary boy had risen to be head of the school. None could equal him at Eton, and his name had gone forth beyond the portals of the college as the coming man of his day. The article in the Free Review, which had first brought his name into prominence in the year 1890, had created a good deal of discussion in many circles. Of course it had been vigorously attacked. What great stroke aimed at justice and freedom but has never been so opposed, hounded down and decried? But truth is like a bright sun which no mortal power can dim. It may be clouded for a time, but it must shine forth and ultimately prevail. He had left Eton, gone to Oxford, and had there taken high honours. He no sooner made his appearance in the world of fashion, politics and letters, than he was received and courted everywhere. Never before had her youth risen so rapidly in the scale of success. He was undoubtedly the idol of his day, and in 1894 only twenty-one. It was extraordinary. Hector de Strange would marvel often at it himself. He had gone out into the world in what was mere childhood, prepared to combat with the many difficulties which he knew must beset his path. He was over-modest was this boy. He had not sufficiently estimated his great and surpassing genius, but it had shone forth, been recognized and approved of, because he was a man. To return to Flora Ruglan. At the age of eighteen she lost her mother, and the guardianship of the girl devolved on her aunt a giddy, worldly woman, the late Marquis's sister and Countess of Dunderfield. No two women could have been more diametrically opposite than these two, no two characters more unlike. 
briefly and to cut the matter short, Lady Dunderfield insisted on taking Flora into society, and set herself to bring about a match between the high-souled, high-spirited girl and the Duke of Dovetail, a rich old monstrosity, whose rent-roll was nigh on a million, and whose body was afflicted by almost every disease under the sun. Had the girl been in a position to map out her own line of life, what a different tale might now be told! She was not. The law denied her the right to choose her future. It curtailed her line of action within certain bounds. What could she do? The odds were against her, and she sought refuge through the first outlet that presented itself. This outlet was in the shape of a young baronet, a youth of twenty-one. He thought himself very much in love with Lady Flora Ruglan. He proposed, and she accepted him. Lady Dunderfield forbade Sir Reginald Desmond the house. The young people took French leave of her, fled to Scotland, and were married, and Lady Dunderfield, green with disappointment and rage, had to accept the fact. This is how Flora Ruglan became Lady Flora Desmond. Had she erred in the step she took? Perhaps so. What other alternative had she? Had the law permitted her to go out into the world and adopt the profession of her choice, there is little doubt that ere this Flora Ruglan would have made a great name for good. He pretends to be offended at her remark, does Jack Delamere, and pulls his horse a little away from her own. She notices the movement and laughs lightly, as she urges her animal alongside him, and taps him gently on the shoulder with her whip. "'Look there, Jack!' she exclaims at the same time. "'We are not the first on the course after all. Look at those two riding over the fence alongside the brook. Who are they, I wonder? The woman can ride. It is easy enough to see that.' They are just turning to the left, through the gate leading to the steeplechase course on the Burton Flats and as Jack Delamere's eyes follow the direction indicated by Flora Desmond, he at once perceives two mounted figures galloping up the course in the direction of the grandstand. One is a man, the other a woman. As Flora Desmond has declared, the woman can ride. She sits her horse straight as a dart. He is pulling a bit, but she has him well in hand, and he is not likely to get away with her. Hector de Strange! by all that's holy, and with a woman, too!" laughs Jack Delamere. "'Look, Florrie, is the world coming to an end, or am I dreaming?' "'That you are certainly not,' she answers quickly. "'There is no mistake about it. But who is she?' They have joined the others now, and find them equally exercised over the female apparition. It may be explained that this is the morning of the Melton Hunt steeplechases, and that this party has ridden over early to the courses to go round the fences and inspect them severally. They had bargained on being the first in the field, but now perceived that they had been forestalled by Hector de Strange and his companion. "'Let's go and have a look,' suggests Lord Westray. He is an admirer of women, and it is easy to perceive, even at the distance which separates the party from the stranger, that she is a fine one. They all gallop down to the stand riding along in a row towards Hector and his friend. He sees them coming, and says something to her, and Flora notices that she brings her horse closer to his side. Mrs. Trevor and Lady Manderton are all eyes and stare as they pass the two. Hector has raised his hat politely and wished them a good morning. His face is flushed with the exercise of riding, his rich auburn hair shines out like gold in the sunlight, his glorious eyes, dark in their sapphire blue, look particularly winning and beautiful. But it is with his companion that the eyes of the others are busy. They are all struck by her extreme loveliness, and are loud in wonder as to who she is. Only Lord Westray is silent, white as a sheet, too. It is years since he set eyes on Lady Elte, and now he sees again, after a long lapse of time, the woman whom he so grievously wronged more than twenty-two years before his divorced wife, Speranza de Lara. "'Come on!' he exclaims, just a shade roughly to Lady Manderton. He has of late been, by the way, making up to her. She has got tired of Sir Arthur Muster Day, and has shelved him for the wicked earl by which name Lord Westray is known in society circles. Mrs. Trevor, too, though she still sticks to kill, 
and makes him believe that she is as devoted to him as ever, has managed to hook on to herself several other devoted swains, to all of whom in turn she expresses a mint of devotion, while really feeling not the slightest affection for any of them. She has played her part well, however, for they each severally believe themselves to be the favoured man in her good graces. They gallop forward in the wick of Lord Westray, and Flora Desmond and Jack Delamere are once more alone. "'What a lovely woman!' she bursts out as soon as they have passed Hector Destrange and Speranza. "'Jack, did you ever see such eyes? I never saw lovelier, unless perhaps Hector Destrange's. What a handsome pair the two make! Well, yes, Florrie, she is certainly a lovely woman. Cunning dog, young Hector, to have kept her out of sight so long. Now we can understand why he is so cold to women. Of course, that's where his heart is, without doubt," answers Jack Delamere with a smile. The Melton Hunt steeplechases of 1894 are over. The meeting will long be remembered by the unparalleled success of Mr. Hector de Strange, who, writing in the six races printed on the card for competition, came in first, the winner of every one of them. This success is all the more remarkable, inasmuch as four of the winners were non-favorites, so that the wins must be ascribed to the splendid horsemanship of their jockey. The feat is unparalleled, the nearest approach to it being when Captain Doggy Smith in 1880 carried off all the races on the card except one, being defeated in a match which closed the day's proceedings between Lord Hastings' memory and Lord James Douglas the general. In this match Doggy Smith rode Lord Hastings' mare and Lord James Douglas his own horse the general. Such is the announcement chronicled in a well-known weekly sporting paper a few days after the Melton Hunt steeplechases of 1894 scoring yet another triumph on the path of thoroughness for Hector de Strange. End of Book One, Chapter Three Book One, Chapter Four of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900 Book One, Chapter Four. So you will not? A thousand times, no! They are standing facing each other, are the speakers, one a beautiful, tall, graceful woman, with masses of rich gold hair coiled upon her noble head, and eyes whose light is like the turquoise gem, the other a middle sized, handsome, good looking man, whose dark eyes gleam with fury and disappointed passion. We have seen them both before, this man and woman, seen them on more than one occasion, for it is not difficult to recognize in that evil-featured man the person of Lord Westray, or in that beautiful woman that of Speranza de Lara. He has come here for no good purpose, has the wicked Earl. Ever since on the Burton Flats he had fallen across the lovely woman whose life he had made a desert. Lord Westray had been a prey to a consuming passion to regain that which he had lost. Twice in her life Speranza had defied him, and on each occasion he had had his revenge. The first was when, as a girl of seventeen, she had refused him, and he, through the instrumentality of his cruel mother, who had played on her love for her brothers, had forced her to become his wife. The second was when, in defiance of man's laws, she had fled from his vile brutality and hateful presence, with the first and last love of her young life, poor Harry Kintor and he, following up those two to the sunny land where they had sought a refuge, and where they asked for no other boon but to be allowed to live with and for each other, had shot down in her very presence the man to save whom she would have given a thousand lives of her own. And now he is here, oblivious of all his past brutality, to insult her with yet another proposal, one more hideous than any he has ever made before. Consumed with passion for this woman, who had defied him, he has actually come to propose that she shall forget the past and remarry him. Forget the past? Is it likely? Will the memory of her suffering childhood ever pass away? Will the recollection of her wedding day fade from her mind? Will the six years of torture as his wedded wife disappear like a dream? Above all, 
Can she ever forget her first meeting with Harry Kintor, the heart's awakening that came with it, or the terrible moment when, struck down at her feet, his dear eyes looked their love for the last time? Impossible. He grinds his teeth with rage, does Lord Westray, as her clear, sad voice distinctly gives him his answer. He is racking his brain for a means of overcoming her, and forcing her once more to obey his will. The fact that she defies him, hates him, loathes him, has refused him, only arouses in him, more madly than ever, the desire to become possessed of her once again. Lord Westray possesses, in a heightened degree, in an aggravated form, the characteristic peculiar to all men, of desiring that which is either hard to get or which denies itself to them, and which, if once obtained, fades in value in their eyes. It is Speranza's resistance to his wishes that fires him with the fury of a wild animal to regain her. "'You shall repent this,' he mutters angrily. "'Speranza, you should know better than to defy me. Have I not been a match for you twice? And by God, if you do not do as I ask now, I will be again.' She shudders with horror as she hears his cold-blooded words, triumphing at his past deeds of brutality and crime. She pulls herself together, however. She is alone with him and must keep him at bay. Speranza is no coward. "'I do not fear you,' she answers haughtily. "'You cannot do me more evil than you have already. I am beyond the reach of your vengeance now. Nothing you can do can harm me.' "'I don't know so much about that,' he replies savagely. "'How about Hector de Strange?' She starts and the rich blood flushes to her face as she eyes him with evident terror. Can it be that he knows, that he will unveil the secret before, but no, it is impossible, she has it safe enough. He notes the start, the crimson blush, and the look of terror, and he congratulates himself on having, by a chance shot, hit on the right point to cow her. "'You are a fine person to play the prude and the proper,' he says with a sneer. They used to tell me that you were inconsolable over that ass Kintor, but the beauty of Hector de Strange appears to have effected a sudden cure. I congratulate you on your new conquest. You have aimed high. He is the rising man of his day, and you have thrown your net well to catch the golden fish. Are you not ashamed of yourself, however, woman, you who are over the forties, to take up with a boy of twenty-one? She flushes again. Then he does not know. Thank God for that! How young she looks as she stands there in her unfading beauty, with a look in her blue eyes of contemptuous loathing. She will let him believe what he likes, so that he does not know the truth. That is all she desires to hide from him. In pursuance of this desire she answers, Hector de Strange and I are friends. I am not ashamed to own it. Neither he nor I require your advice, however as to how our friendship is to be conducted. And now I bid you leave me. I order you from my house, which I inhabit not by your charity. No, but by the charity of Harry Kintor, you wanton," he answers with an oath. You knew pretty well what you were about when you got the fool to settle all his estates and money on you, which you now lavish on Hector de Strange. But, peace, devil, fiend in human shape! she cries furiously, as she clutches her hands and brings the right one down with a crash on the table beside her. He notices a flash on one of the fingers. All the others are ringless but this one, and on it sparkles two splendid diamonds and sapphires, set deep in their broad thick band of gold. He knows this ring of old. He saw it long ago, when she held the dying head of Harry Kintor in her hands, and he knows that it was the young man's gift to her that she should wear it, now that she is taken up with Hector de Strange, mystifies him. He is about to reply, when the door of the room they are in opens, and Lord Westray finds himself face to face with Hector. He is a head and shoulders taller than the Earl, is this young man, and as he advances into the room the latter's face falls slightly, and his fingers move nervously by his side. Like all bullies, Lord Westray is a coward, and doesn't half fancy his position but there is no angry look in Hector de Strange's eyes, 
only from their sapphire depths looks out a cold, calm expression of contempt. "'Lord Westray,' he remarks in a voice impressive because of its very quietness, "'for what reason have we the honour of your presence here? Allow me to inform you that this honour is not desired by Mrs. Delara. Your brougham is at the door. I must request you seek it.' He says no more, but stands with the handle of the door in his hand, waiting for the Earl to obey. This latter looks at him fiercely, the eyes of the two meet. Those of the bully and depraved coward cannot face the calm, disdainful look of Hector de Strange. They fall before it, and in another moment the Earl is gone. They listen to the wheels of the departing brougham as it rattles through the streets in the direction of South Kensington. As its echoes die away, the young man turns to Speranza. "'Mother!' he exclaims. "'Has he been here to insult you? Ah, mother, God only knows the strain I put upon myself, or I would have shot him down where he stood, the brute, the fiend. I nearly lost control of myself, but I heard your last words and understood what you are striving to hide from him. Thank God I did, or in a hasty moment I might have laid bare our secret. And I too say thank God, Gloria. At one moment I fancied he was in possession of it, but I quickly found out that he was on another tack. Horrible as the idea was, it was better to let him foster it than to give him a chance of learning the truth. Ah, Gloria, dearest, if once the secret is in his hands, we need look for no mercy in that quarter. I know it, mother, answers Gloria, in other words, Hector de Strange for the reader must have had no difficulty in recognizing in this latter the beautiful girl who had made her vow to the wild sea-waves ten years previously on the sunny shores of the Adriatic, and who now, as Hector de Strange, is working out the accomplishment of that vow. And she has worked well, has Gloria de Lara, patiently and perseveringly, never losing an opportunity, never casting a chance aside. Her beauty and her genius have gone straight to the hearts of men, and she uses these gifts given her by God not for vain glory or fleeting popularity, but in the pursuit of justice and in furtherance of the one great aim of her life. "'Let us change the subject, my darling,' exclaims Speranza with a shudder. "'Let us drive from our minds the thought of one so horrible and contemptible. Tell me, my precious child,' she continues, laying her hand on Gloria's shoulder and kissing her gently on the forehead. How have you got on with the clubs to-day? Excellently, mother. I came to tell you all about them, or I should not have been here until to-morrow, answers Gloria, as she seats herself on a low stool at her mother's feet. It is the middle of May, the sun is shining brightly, and the sparrows are hopping and chirping merrily about in the square outside. The early green on the trees is as yet unclouded by the dust of London's busy season, and all is fair and soft and young to look upon. The large fortune and noble estates left to Speranza Dallara by young Harry Kintor had been well and wisely wielded by the woman, in whose heart the memory of her darling still shines as brightly as on the day he died. She has never misspent a farthing of the vast wealth that he confided to her care. It has been used in carrying out philanthropic works, alleviating suffering, and helping on the accomplishment of their child's design, his child and hers. They are busy over a new one just now. With her mother's money at her command, Gloria, under the name of Hector de Strange, is establishing throughout London, and in the different large towns of Great Britain and Ireland, institutions where women and girls can meet each other, and for a mere nominal fee learn to ride, to shoot with gun and rifle, to swim, to run, and to indulge in the invigorating influences of gymnastics and other exercises, calculated to strengthen and improve the physique of those taking part therein. Classes, too, technical and otherwise, for the education of girls and women on an equality with boys and men, as well as free libraries, form part of these institutions, each of which, as it is founded, becomes crowded to overflowing. In connection with these institutions, Glory has lately set on foot clubs, the members of which she is forming into volunteer companies, who are drilled by the hand of discipline into smartness and efficiency. The movement has been enthusiastically taken up by the women of Great Britain and Ireland, thousands of whom have been enrolled in these volunteer forces. 
Of course, Hector de Strange has his enemies, the jealous and the narrow-minded. The old fogies, who would have a great wrong continue forever rather than fly in the face of prejudice to right it. The women who love their degradation and hug their chains. The men who think the world must be coming to an end if women are to be acknowledged as their equals, have all fought tooth and nail against the splendid idea and the practical conception of Hector de Strange. Ridicule, abuse, calumny, false testimony have been hurled against his giant work. They have each and all failed to disturb or harm it, for its foundation is built on the rock of justice, of right, and of nature. "'Well, mother,' continues the girl, "'we have had a great consultation today. All the details for a big review have been discussed. We shall want two good years more to get everything efficiently arranged, when I calculate that Hector de Strange will be able to bring into the field quite one hundred thousand well-drilled troops. But I am in no hurry yet, there is still much to be done. And now I have some more news to give you, mother. I have been invited to stand by the Douglasdale Division of Dumfrieshire for Parliament and to contest the seat when Mr. Reform resigns. I saw Archie Douglasdale today. He has promised to give me all his support. And what do you think, mother? Why, his sister, Lady Flora Desmond, has joined our new club. It is to be called the Desmond Lodge, and I have put her in command of it." "'She will be a great help to you, Gloria,' answers Speranza. "'From all you have told me of her, she is the right sort in the right place. She is indeed, mother, although I have many a good and true lieutenant, thoroughly in touch with my ideas in our volunteer force, there is not one that can come up to Lady Flora. She will be a mountain of help to me, and I know I can trust her. I could trust her even with our secret. Oh, never divulge that, Gloria! Not I, mother. It was only an allegory, to give you an idea of my high opinion of her. But till the right time comes, our secret will be with me as silent as the grave." They talk on, busy with their plans, hopeful of the future, and what it is to bring do these two women. The afternoon flits by, the chirp of the sparrows grows dull, the sun is sinking aslant the roofs of the opposite houses, the evening is creeping on apace. Gloria Delara rises from her seat and throws her arms around Speranza's neck. "'I must go now, mother,' she says gently. "'I wish I could stay, but I have an engagement. Good night, my precious mother. Kiss Gloria before she goes.' "'God bless you, my child,' answers the mother, as she presses the girl to her heart. "'God bless you and keep you prospering in your work, my valiant young Hector de Strange.' And the girl passes out from her mother's presence into the silent square. She is echoing Speranza's prayer and is pulling herself together, for out of that mother's presence she has her part to play. She is no longer Gloria Delara, but popular, successful Hector de Strange. There is yet another scene at which we must glance before this chapter closes. Let us enter Lord Westray's house in Grosvenor Square. He is in the drawing-room pacing up and down, his face dark with anger and passion. A footman enters, bearing on a massive silver salver a tiny scented bijou note. He hands the missive respectfully to his lordship, who takes it impatiently. "'The bearer is to wait for an answer, my lord.' "'Answer be damned!' begins Lord Westray, but suddenly, recollecting himself, he continues, "'Very well, Walter. Come up when I ring.' "'Yes, my lord.' The servant retires. His face is very grave, but it relaxes into a leer as he closes the door. "'Specs the old un's rather tired of her by now. Gives her another week before they says good morning to each other.' He soliloquizes to himself as he goes downstairs. As he does so, Lord Westray opens the note. It is from Lady Manderton and runs as follows. "'Dearest old Potsy, have got a ripping little supper on tonight. Man's away, and we will have some fun. Have asked several kindred spirits. Shall look for you at ten. Your ever-devoted Dodo.' "'I can't go,' he mutters. "'Hang the woman. I'm sick of her. She was all very well a little while ago, but nothing will satisfy me but Speranza now.' I will have her or nobody. And if I don't have her, I will have what's next best, revenge." He writes a note hastily. It is to excuse himself. 
He has an awful headache and cannot come. Lady Manderton gets the note a quarter of an hour later, and bites her lip as she reads it. "'Never mind,' she says quietly. "'He shan't have another chance. My next man is Spicer. He's rich, he's good-looking, he's awfully in love, and he'll be very useful. He'll do.' She sits down and writes another note. It is addressed to the Honorable Amia Spicer, Grenadier Guards. She sends him the same sort of invitation which she sent to Lord Westray. It is not long before an answer comes back. Amia Spicer is in the seventh heaven. He will be sure to come. And at ten o'clock he comes punctually. Poor young fool! End of Book One, Chapter Four Book One, Chapter Five of Gloriana or The Revolution of 1900 by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana or The Revolution of 1900. Book One, Chapter Five Montreguy House is decked out at its brightest. The noble owner, Evelyn, Duke of Ravensdale, is giving a ball this night to which all the pearl of London society has been bidden. Flocks of royalties have been also invited, and nearly all have signified their intention of being present. It is a wonderful sight as one drives up to the entrance gates of the great mansion, which is ablaze with light. Every window is neatly framed in soft green moss, from out of which fairy lamps peep and sparkle like thousands of glow-worms. Festoons of roses twine around the porch pillars of the great front door, and the scene that greets the eye on entry almost baffles description. Floating throughout the corridors and vestibules come the soft sounds of dreamy music. The atmosphere is redolent with the sweet scent of rare and lovely flowers. The place is a wilderness of beautiful sights, as up and down the broad flights of the magnificent staircase well-known men and women come and go. A burst of martial music ever and anon heralds the approach of royalty. As each successive arrival takes place, the brilliant crowd sways to and fro to catch a sight of the gods which it adores. Above, the sound of lively strains announces that dancing has begun, and everyone hurries to take part in the pleasure of the light fantastic toe. The dance music has suddenly ceased. Everyone has turned to ascertain the cause. The noble host is observed to be making for the center of the magnificent suite of rooms where everyone is enjoying his or herself. He carries in his hand a telegram, and with the other hand, slightly raised, appears to be enjoining silence. Very striking to look at is Evelyn, Duke of Ravensdale. His age may be between twenty-five and twenty-six. He is very tall and broad-shouldered. His hair, dark as the raven's wing, close curls about his forehead, which is high and white and intellectual. His eyes are also very dark, with a soft, dreamy look in them his mouth firm set and well made, is sheltered by a long silken moustache. Silence has sunk on all around. One might hear a pin-drop so intense has it become. Every one is on a tiptoe of expectation. The sight of that telegram has set every heart beating. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' calls out the Duke, raising it on high, "'I have good news for you all.' This is a telegram for my dear friend Hector de Strange. He has beaten his opponent by 2,330 votes, and is now member for the Douglasdale Division of Dumfrieshire. What a shout goes up! Men and women cheer again and again. It is felt that the pinnacle of fame on which that young man rests has gone up higher in the scale of merited success. Even his enemies cannot help feeling glad for Hector de Strange is a name to conjure by. "'He'll be Prime Minister before another year or two are gone,' exclaimed Sir Randolph Fisticuffs, just a little jealousy to a lady by his side. She looks at him earnestly as she replies, "'God bless the day when he is. We shall get justice then.' "'Oh!' he answers pettishly. "'That's just it. He has set all you women discontented with your lot. He has set a fire which won't be readily extinguished. Mark my words, he'll burn his fingers over it yet, if he don't take care." "'Not he,' she answers stoutly. "'Hector de Strange knows what he is about. 
he has won the devoted, undying love of hundreds, nay thousands and tens of thousands of women, for his brave, chivalrous exposure of their wrongs and defense of their rights." Sir Randolph Fisticuffs laughs. "'You ought to join the Woman's Volunteer Corps,' he observes sarcastically. "'Ought I?' She opens her gray eyes wide. "'As it happens, I joined it a year ago.' "'The devil you did!' he exclaims in a surprised tone. "'So you are a hectored a strange eye, eh?' "'I am,' she answers proudly. The music has recommenced. A dreamy waltz is sounding through the room. Everyone has begun dancing again. Only the dowagers are at rest. Not a man appears unoccupied. Yes, one is, though. It is the young Duke of Ravensdale himself. He is leaning against a bank of moss and roses, apparently watching the busy throng. There is a faraway look in his eyes, however, which tells that his thoughts have flown beyond the giddy pastime of the hour. He is thinking of his friend's latest triumph, and what will be the outcome of it all. For Evelyn Ravensdale's heart has gone out to Hector de Strange, and he loves him with that devoted, admiring love which some men have been known to inspire in others. "'Just look at the Duke,' whispers Lady Tabicat to her friend Mrs. Moreton Savage. "'One would think there isn't a pretty girl in the room, or a heart aching for him, by the way he stands there, doing nothing and saying nothing. I can't think what makes him so shy and reserved. He was all fire just now when he was telling us of Hector de Strange's triumph, and now just look at him, my dear." Mrs. Moreton Savage does look at him, but she is just as far from making him out as her friend Lady Tabby-Cat is. Mrs. Moreton Savage is a dame whose mind has never soared beyond the fitting on of a dress, the making of matches, and the desirability of knowing all the best people in society. She has worked assiduously with those aims in view and has the satisfaction of knowing that she has been more or less successful. Such a thought as the condition of society and the people in the past, present, and future has never entered her brain. She is quite content that things should go on exactly as they are, that there should be immense riches on one side, intense misery and poverty on the other. Such problems as the relation of man and woman in this world, and the terrible evils arising out of the false position of the sexes, has never troubled her. She has no wish to see mankind perfected, or to play society on a higher level and basis than it is. There is just this difference, therefore, between herself and the man whom she and Lady Tabicat are discussing, and that is that he does. Often and often have the young Duke and Hector de Strange discussed these problems together in their early morning rides or cozy after-dinner chats. It is Hector de Strange who has converted him to his present way of thinking. He had come into his property a sufficiently self-conceited, spoilt young man, with the world at his feet, men and women angling for his favors, as many will do to the high-born and the rich. He had never paused to wonder what he should do with his money, and position, and power. He was preparing himself to enjoy life in the only way which up till then he had viewed as possible when a fateful chance threw him in the path of Hector de Strange. Men wondered at the change in the young Duke of Ravensdale. It was such a sudden one, they could not make it out. It mystified them altogether. Some put it down to love, and wondered who was the lucky one. He has roused himself from his dreams with a shake and a start, and is standing upright now. A boy is passing close by him a boy with pretty curling brown hair and large hazel eyes, a boy in whose face laughter and happiness are shining brightly, a boy whose life so far has been sunshine perpetual, without the storm and the hurricane. It would hardly be possible to find two brothers more extremely unlike than Evelyn, Duke of Ravensdale, and his younger and only brother, Lord Bernard Fontenoy. No one looking at the two standing together would take them to be related, certainly not so closely as they are. "'Bernie!' calls the Duke as the boy passes along, and in an instant this latter is at his side. "'Yes, Evie?' he asks inquiringly, looking up into his brother's face. "'Anything you want me to do?' "'Yes, dear,' answers the Duke. "'I want you to take my place for an hour or two. 
I have business that calls me away. Now, do you think, Bernie, that I can trust your giddy head to see to everything in my absence?" "'Giddy head?' pouts the boy, pretending to look seriously offended. "'If you did well nigh eight months' hard study out of twelve, you would like to enjoy yourself in the few hours snatched from toil and mental struggle. Poor boy, you look hard-worked and suffering," laughs the Duke, as he eyes the bright, healthy, handsome face of the youthful complainant. But seriously, Bernie, can I trust you to overlook everything for me? Of course you can, Evie," replies Bernard, with a look of importance. I promise you, I will see to everything tip-top. I suppose if you're away, I shall have to take in the Princess to supper, shan't I? Do you think Her Royal Highness will put up with a jackanapes like me?" "'I think so, Bernie. However, you must do your best. Go and make my excuses to the Prince. A sudden business calls me away. I will be back as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, my boy, do your best to take my place. I'm sure I can trust you.' He lays his hand gently on the boy's shoulder as he turns to go. Bernie Fontenoy idolizes his brother, but he feels at this moment as if there is nothing in the wide world he would not do for him, if it were in his power. E.B. Ravensdale passes quickly down the beautiful grand staircase towards the front door. Pompous servants are hurrying to and fro. A big portly butler, with a magnificent white waistcoat and ponderously heavy gold chain, is giving his orders in a voice the importance of which can only be measured by the value he puts upon himself. As he sees the Duke descending, however, he moderates his tone and is all obsequiousness in a moment. "'Repton, give me my cloak and hat, please,' commands the Duke in a quiet, civil voice, and the magnificent functionary hastens to obey. He is wondering all the time, however, what it can be that takes his grace out at such a time. "'A handsome Repton, please!' Repton turns to a crimson-plushed, knee-breeched, white silk stocking subordinate. "'Call a handsome, John,' he says loftily. It would be quite impossible for himself, the great Mr. Repton, to perform such a menial office. No one could expect it of him. The whistle rings through Whitehall. Rumbling wheels answer the summons. In a few minutes a hansom dashes up. The great Mr. Repton holds open the front door. Evie Ravensdale passes out. One of the crimson-plushed, knee-breeched menials unfolds the cab doors, and stands with his hands over the wheels while his master springs in, then he closes them too. "'Where to, your grace?' he inquires respectfully. And Evie Ravensdale, looking up at his brilliantly lighted luxurious mansion above him, answers somewhat absently, "'Whitechapel.' The fit is on him to see and contrast the misery of some of London's quarters with the wealth and the luxury which he has just quitted. Hector de Strange's telegram has brought it to his mind. He remembers his last conversation with that dearly beloved friend, and how it had turned on that very point. The splendor of his own mansion, the brilliancy that he saw around him a few minutes since, is about to be changed for cold, dark, ill-lighted streets, narrow alleys, and filthy courts. He wants to see it all for himself. The hansom rattles through the streets. It goes at a good pace, but it seems a long time getting to its destination. At length it pulls up. "'What part of Whitechapel, sir?' inquires the cabman, looking through the aperture in the roof of his vehicle. "'You may put me down here, cabby,' answers the young duke, handing him a half-sovereign. "'And if you like to wait for me, I may be about an hour gone.' I'll pay you well if you will." "'You're a gentleman, and I see that pretty plainly,' answers the cabman glibly, as he touches his hat and pockets the half-sovereign. "'I'll wait, sir, no fear.'" Evelyn Ravensdale wanders through the gloomy, ill-lighted streets. Midnight has chimed out from Big Ben, it is getting on towards one o'clock, and he does not meet many people. A policeman or two saunter along their beats, and turn their lights upon him as he passes. Sometimes a man and woman flit past him, or a solitary man by himself. He passes a dark, gloomy-looking archway into which the light from a flickering gas-lamp just penetrates. He can see a boy and girl with white, pinched faces asleep in an old barrel in one corner, a shivering, skinny dog curled up at their feet. 
The sight is terrible to him. He steps into the archway and touches the boy on the shoulder. With a frightened cry the lad starts up and eyes him beseechingly. "'Ah, uh, Bobby, don't turn us out tonight,' he says pleadingly. "'Maggie's so poorly and sick she can hardly stand up. See, she's asleep now. Don't wake her, please, Bobby, don't!' He starts suddenly and pulls his forelock as he perceives that it is not a policeman he is talking to. "'Beg pardon, sir,' he says. "'Thought it was a bobby.' "'Have you no better place than this to sleep in, my poor lad?' inquires the duke pityingly, his hand still on the boy's shoulder. "'Ah, sir, this is a grand place. We don't always get the likes of this. Poor Maggie, she was so pleased when we found this here barrel. See, sir, how she do sleep!' "'Is Maggie your sister?' asked the young duke, with a half-sob. "'No, sir, she's my gal. Maggie and me, we've been together a long time now, we has.' "'And what do you do for a living, boy?' continues Evelyn Ravensdale gently. "'Anything, sir, we can get to do. It's not always we can get a job, and then we have to go hungry like—' "'My God!' bursts from the young man's lips, but he says no more. The next moment he has pressed a couple of sovereigns into the poor lad's hand and is gone. He wanders on through the same street. He takes no note of the name of it. His thoughts are far too busy for that. He is approaching another street, less lonely and better lighted than the one he is in. There are more people about and he sees several women loitering up and down near the corner. Instinctively he crosses the street so as to avoid them. Two of them are making off after two men that have just passed by, the third is left alone. She spies the young duke at once and runs across the street to cut him off. He sees he cannot avoid her and pulls himself together. In another moment she is by his side with one hand on his arm. "'Won't you come home with me, dear?' she says softly. "'Won't you—' "'Peace, woman!' he almost shouts as he flings off her hand from his arm. She starts back with a low cry, and he sees a face, young still, with traces of great beauty, but careworn and haggard with suffering. His heart is filled with a great pity. He feels that such sights as these are unendurable to him. He feels that he cannot face them. "'Poor thing! Poor thing!' he says gently. "'Forgive me if I was rough to you. This is no place for you, my child.' You look a mere child. Are you not one?" "'I am eighteen, she stammers. Eighteen, and so fallen!' he exclaims in a horrified tone. "'Ah, child, get away out of this!' "'And starve?' she ejaculates bitterly. "'Easy for you to talk. You're not starving.' "'Starving!' he utters that word with a peculiar intonation. It tells her what pity there is in his heart for her. "'Oh, sir,' she exclaims, "'I would not be here if I were not driven to it. I don't want to be here. I hate it. I hate it. It is my hard, hard fate that I am here.' "'Have you no father, no mother to care for you?' he asks sadly. "'No, sir, not to care for me,' she answers with a sob. "'Father's in jail. Mother walks the streets like me to make her bread. She told me I'd better do so too unless I wanted to starve. That's how it is, sir." He covers his face with one hand and groans aloud. His thoughts have rushed back to the luxury he has but lately quitted. He compares it with the misery he has just witnessed. Once more his hand is in his pocket. "'If I give you this, my child,' he says, drawing out a five-pound note, Will you promise me to go home at once and leave these streets of infamy and wrong? And if I give you my card and promise to place you in a way of earning an honest livelihood, will you call at my house tomorrow for a letter which I will leave to be given to you? Will you try and get your mother, too, to come with you?" She bursts into tears. "'Ah, sir, may God in heaven bless you! Yes, yes, I will promise. Indeed I will. Gladly, too gladly. He holds out to her the card and the banknote. As she takes them she bends over his hand and kisses it passionately. He draws it gently away. "'Remember your promise,' 
he says quietly. I will, she answers between her sobs. Oh, God, I would die for you, sir. He watches her as she turns away and disappears in the gloom. Heavy tears are in his eyes. I must go home now, he whispers to himself. I cannot see more. End of Book One, Chapter Five